So this is me. I'm the one frowning because I hate being in front of cameras. <laughs> How ironic. So, but at the same time, uh, frowning or otherwise, I wanted to do something important with my life right from the get-go. I wanted to, I had studied about St. Francis of Assisi and Dorothy Day, I was a young Catholic. I loved our first Catholic president of the United States, John F. Kennedy, and I loved the actions of Martin Luther King. And so I was inspired to do something, I just didn't know what. This is me at my graduation, actually for my associates, I was receiving an award because I had bragged to my economic professor that I wanted to be the first woman president of the United States. Well, obviously not. <laughs> but what I did do was fall into, if there's such a thing, the field of sustainable building. Sustainable building is the method of design and construction that provides for current generations without sacrificing the needs of future generations. What I like about it is it's a very practical way of dealing with a very big problem which is to address the fact that we live on a finite planet with a very delicate balance of resources such as the air and water depicted in this photo. But which balance is terribly upset by our consumptive patterns, which is represented in this photo. The other thing I liked about my career was that mostly I could just write about it. I could write and research and, and feel like I was doing something. But you know, God has a funny way with me and he kept putting me in front of people. And people like you in places like this, influential clients, training professionals who were not always happy with what I was telling them. And so I ended up often being, uh, actually having performance anxiety, a lot of performance anxiety, and with that goes fatigue. So after years of alternating between burnout and performance anxiety, I found myself on a plane ride to Colorado. I was being interviewed for a competitive uh, project and I was very concerned and actually I was quite depressed. I was fatigued, of course, but I was also depressed because I wasn't sure I could do this particular project with the particular budget that they were offering. And so I decided on the plane that the best I could do was tell this prospective client the truth, to actually share my concerns. And I immediately felt elated and realized that what made me happy was being of service, that it didn't really matter whether I got the job or not. So at that moment, I made a lifetime commitment, which I kept right up to this moment, which is to ask myself, how can I be of service in this moment? When I started asking that question, it turned things around for me. And when I heard the term servant leadership uh, sometime later, it totally resonated for me. Uh, if you haven't heard the term, Robert Greenleaf, a Quaker and a management consultant for AT&T, coined the term in 1970, which was actually the year I graduated from my BA. Um, and what it means, uh, and I'll paraphrase it, he defined it as a test, um, which is that those who you lead actually grow and are moved to serve themselves. And actually anyone who is vulnerable is not harmed by your leadership. So that was the term. So I liked the, the thing so much, I liked the concept so much that I, I brought it to my business. And this is, these are my employees. Um, and what I did was actually everyone who is hired by O'Brien and Company <clears throat> gets a book about servant leadership and there actually it was the topic of several company retreats like this one in 2008. Then I decided, well, I'm really going to be brave and I'm going to introduce this to clients but I ran into a brick wall. The problem was it seems like servant leadership doesn't seem like an urgent thing. It doesn't seem like it moves quickly. And the, the response that I got was, well, that's a nice concept, but we don't have time for servant leadership. Well, we don't have time for quick fixes that don't work either. So, because one of the things that I have seen is that the command and control approach, which this team really wanted, and that many of my colleagues think will quickly solve the problems uh, that we face with, with building, uh, don't solve it in a lasting way. We don't get lasting transformation from things like that. Um, and in fact, often when you have a green building standard that is turned into a requirement or a code without educated buy-in, what you get at best is passive compliance, at worst gaming the system. So I knew that what I was doing worked, but I also as a servant leader needed to 
listen and figure out, well, what are these people telling me? What's not working? So I kind of went back to the drawing board and realized that um, I wasn't just talking, I wasn't just performing servant leadership, that I was also about change. I wasn't just leading for good, I was leading for change. And I had drawn over the years from folks like uh, Mackenzie Moore, Wheatley, Doppelt, uh, and more recently from Chip and Dan Heath for their excellent psychological explanation of change dynamics and with regard to Wheatley, scientific change uh, to, uh, to uh, change dynamics. And then I had been incorporating that in my work, just kind of gradually over the years. The second thing I realized was that anything that I had done well had really been done collaboratively. I hadn't done it alone. And so those three things now, servant leadership and change practice and technology and then community, really together was what I was doing. So I actually decided to sell my business to some of these employees and decided to focus entirely on what I call emergent leadership in the style of a snowflake. And the snowflake is, a, it's the natural phenomenon of emergence where a multiplicity of elements come together to create a larger system that is functional, carries water, that is beautiful, and that is unique which is how I believe we need to lead in our own beautiful way. And so the thing about, uh, that I also like about emergence is that it doesn't require the kind of heroics, you know, riding in on a horse, that anybody can be it. I mean, look at me, I'm the one who's frowning, I was the one who's introverted, and I can be a leader. So it, does, it doesn't require that kind of thing. And I have a couple of examples. A young lady thought she was too young to be a leader, and I said, no, no, no. So now she writes a column in a regular, a regular column in a newspaper. Um, she also sits on a building codes commission, um, which is a pretty good coup for a young person. And it also works for established folks as well who are dealing with people who report to them and don't want to do what they're doing. So in sum, we have servant leadership, we have change practitioners, and we have community or co collective intelligence and love. So what is it that you could do today? There's lots of different things that you could do today. And what I'd like to do is ask you to ask yourself whenever faced with an issue, how can I be of service to engage in your community because it's no accident that you're there and to love your community, love your community and do what you can. Thank you very much.